Last December, the first person died of Ebola in West Africa. Today, in the 10 months since, more than 4,500 have died. As the deaths multiply and the coverage intensifies, many people are still asking some very basic questions, still unsure of the answers. Tonight, we try to help. Your questions to our national checkup panel. At the table, Dr. Susan Potnan, an infectious disease specialist at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. Dr. Danielle Martin from Women's College Hospital in Toronto. And Dr. Tim Jagatic from Doctors Without Borders. Also joining us, our own Adrian Arsenault, who was in Liberia covering this story just last month. Their answers in a minute, but first, a quick update. Ebola is still a long way from our shores, and it may never get here. But in parts of West Africa, things are worse than they were when we first unveiled this map four weeks ago. Then, Ebola was just reported in the countries painted red, with numbers in the low thousands. Here's what's happened since. The numbers keep going up, doubling in the past month as the disease is growing exponentially. More than 9,000 cases overall now, and while the disease has slowed down or has been wiped out in Nigeria and Senegal, it's still a major problem in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. The death rate is staggering, more than 50%. But now there are cases outside West Africa too. Not many, but it does show its move. Eight in the United States, three in Spain, three in Germany, one each in France, Britain, and Norway. Of those 17, most have either recovered or are in treatment. Four have died. The past months have seen millions of dollars of new aid money and hundreds of healthcare workers offering to go to the worst hit areas. It's also seen the worldwide implementation of travel restrictions, airport testing, hospital drills, and the growth of fear, often unwarranted fear. Especially with little ones because they're always touching and tasting. But the world is worried and confused. We ask for your questions. We have them, so let's start with some answers. And we've had lots of questions coming in by email, by Twitter, and by video, and we'll show you some of the best ones tonight. And some of them are very basic, like this very first one that starts uh, from uh, Michael Danetsk. And Danielle, I want you to answer this. What is the method of transmission for Ebola? In other words, how do you get it? Sure. Well, person-to-person -person transmission of Ebola occurs through direct contact with the body fluids of a person who's uh, infected. And you have to actually transmit the virus into your own body, either through broken skin or mucous membranes. So you, know, you touch the bodily fluids or a, a bed sheet or a piece of clothing that's contaminated, and then you rub your own eye um, or, you know, eat, eat something without washing your hands in between. It's, it's not airborne. You can't get it from just... Uh, breathing the same air as someone, there actually has to be direct contact, contact so with it, fluids. It has to be direct contact. So if somebody like sneezes on the other side of the room, somebody who is infected, that doesn't necessarily mean you suddenly should be rushing So the sneeze example is an interesting one because droplets, I mean, if somebody sneezes a really wet sneeze into your face, I suppose it's possible, but, um, but it's not an airborne disease. So you don't see the virus hanging suspended in the air uh, for long periods of time the way that you can see with other viruses. It's not... Um, a super easy disease to transmit. All right. Next question came in on uh, Twitter. Uh, this tweet from uh, John Pisma in Laval. And Susan, you think about this one. What are some early signs, symptoms of the virus? What are they? If a person's presenting, they'll start off with nonspecific symptoms like you'd have with any virus infection. So they'll have fever, headache, muscle aches, joint pains, something like you'd experience, for example, when you have influenza. Mm -hmm. Days into it, a few days thereafter, you'll start developing symptoms that are more specific to Ebola, which includes a sore throat, pain on swallowing, vomiting, and significant watery diarrhea. It's only after that then you develop symptoms where you go into what we call shock and or have something called DIC, where you actually have potential for bleeding complications. But those first signs are fever Fever, signs. headache, muscle aches, joint pains. All right. Let's bring Adrienne into the conversation. So she's been back for three weeks now, but she's been... I guess, self-monitoring. Uh, Adrian, what are you doing? How are you keeping a check on yourself? 
Well, Peter, I can tell you that we're not in quarantine, and that's because we know we weren't exposed to the fluids of infected people. We're just doing what a lot of people who've been in the zone are doing, which is that we're working off site for a 21 day period. It's more of a social calming thing, it's not medically indicated at all. Uh, the basic protocol is that we monitor our temperatures a couple times a day. We're looking for spikes in the temperature, and in the unlikely event of that, we're always about 20 minutes away from a certain hospital. But, you know, really, the reality check is everybody's fine, everybody's healthy. Uh, we know we weren't exposed, and so there really isn't a risk. All right, next question. And this comes from uh, Donna Jurek in Hamilton, Ontario. And Tim, this is one for you. Why do some people survive Ebola and not others? You know, we talked about that 50% rate. Since that rate isn't 100%, why are some people surviving, not others? Yeah, so there are certain things that we have noticed that are associated with survival rates, increasing survival rates. So when somebody comes early on in the, in the progression of disease, when they're still in the fever muscle ache stage and they start their treatment, and the treatment is very basic with Tylenol for the fever, with fluids to just keep themselves replenished, uh, we're seeing better results with them. Also, people who are just in a better state of health to begin with, who have a, a more functional immune system, they're doing well is uh, much better than, than the others. So these are the real factors that we're seeing. You know, it, it's amazing when you talk about a killer disease and yet that early treatment is so basic, so simple. What we're seeing with this disease is <laughs> we're demystifying it. We're destigmatizing it. We saw this thing show up in 1976 so mysteriously. We didn't know what it was, and we didn't know how to deal with it. But then when we started intervening with it, we started seeing real significant progress and with the most basic things. And we saw a huge drop in the mortality rate with the most basic things. And when we started doing a little bit more intervention, we saw an e even more of a drop in, in the mortality rates. So this is what we're trying to tell the world, that every time that we intervene, we're getting positive results. And that's why we want to see more people helping us on the ground. All right, let's uh, go to the next question. This one uh, uh, comes from uh, Casper Leal. What are the chances of Ebola mutating and becoming more of a threat like airborne? Uh, who wants to try that, Susan? There's always a theoretical possibility with any virus that it can mutate and change. We have seen that this virus, as it's going through different populations of people, indeed is changing as we expect it to. We've had no indication that it actually is developing any new virulence factors or ability to change how it's currently behaving. In the theoretical possibility that it could, which you can never rule out anything in terms of viruses and potential, we have to remember that even if it were to change and become airborne, it may actually ultimately change in what it can do. Um, so when you develop one mutation, it may offset another potential factor within that virus, and it may no longer be able to actually transmit um, person to person as easily outside of airborne, and it may not actually be able to cause symptoms or, or death. So there's always a theoretical possibility that a virus can change as it's actually going through populations. One can postulate to the nth degree. Ultimately, there's no data that it's actually doing it, and it's not likely a high possibility. When, when you study past viruses, ones that have mutated, does, is time a factor in this? Time and, and simply the, the amount of virus. So the, the, the more virus you have, the more virus that's replicating, the more chance you have that it can actually replicate in, in, in terms of having a mistake that is allowing for the survival of the fittest virus, so to speak. Oh. All right, let's go on to the next one. Uh, here it is. It comes from uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick. Anna Cameron asks, how long can the virus live outside of the body? That's a good one, Danielle. Um, well, if you clean up, after um, a surface or um, a, you know, an operating room table or a bed has uh, been in contact with body fluids, it, it really can't, as far as we know, pretty much survive at all. It takes pretty basic cleaning um, to get rid of the virus. If you have a surface that's contaminated that hasn't been cleaned up, um, it may be able to survive a few days, um, but it is hours to days, it's not weeks. Uh, and, and again, just back to this point about demystifying uh, this virus, you know, we just as we treat the virus the same way we treat other basic viruses with fluids and Tylenol and basic care, similarly, we clean up this virus using the same kinds of basic cleaning methods that we use um, to disinfect uh, surfaces that are, that are dirty. But if it, uh, you know, it, say it was on a table, you know, sure. in, a, a, in a restaurant that somehow they didn't wipe down in between uh, uh, customers, 
it could in fact last for, for hours, maybe even days? It, it's possible. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the, with the conditions. Um, so a lot of the, the studies that have looked at this question of how long it can, uh, can survive have, have taken place in uh, non-real world conditions, you know, in laboratory. So if you keep the room dark and you have the perfect humidity for Ebola to replicate, um, then you may be able to have a, um, you know, a virus that can last a number of days. In the real world, uh, it probably doesn't survive that long. All right, let's uh, go to our next question. It comes in by video from Tim Wolfgang. Hi, Peter. My question for you and the panelists tonight is why we don't have a travel ban in Canada to countries affected with the Ebola epidemic. All right, very straightforward. Tim, answer to that, is there one? Well, this, first of all, there is no direct flights for any of these countries to Canada. Mm -hmm. But uh, to, to, to focus on this question, there are direct flights in Europe. Eventually, and there's a direct America. flight. Yeah. <laughs> but the, th the basic idea is this. It won't work. It simply will not work. Somebody who wants to get out will get out. It's just a matter, like, that's how it, the, the, the world is today. And what we have to do is we have to address this situation uh, not with black and white simplified logic, not saying, oh, if you stop them from coming, they won't come. We have to address this with a sense of compassion and trust building. So when we have somebody who comes to the United States or comes to Europe, and they do, in fact, show up to have the, the Ebola virus and they're Ebola positive, we want them to have the ability to know the, the trust in the system that they can come there and they can get the treatment that they need, rather than the fear of wondering, will they be persecuted? Will somebody try to stop them? Will, the, will their family be in danger? And that would prevent them from going to be treated, and then that could potentially lead to even more complications. All right, let me bring Adrian in here, because, you know, obviously she went to Liberia, and then she came back, so she was going through airports. Uh, tell us about that experience, uh, Adrian, that you had. Well, people will tell you what scares them about all this talk of travel bans is how do you get supplies and aid workers into the country. When we flew in, uh, the plane was hardly full of relief workers, hardly full of supplies. When you leave Liberia, you fill out a series of forms. They're all honor-based. You get your temperature taken, not particularly comforting. The readings all seem to be exceptionally low. But then when you get into Canada, uh, we were flagged right away. Uh, we admitted where we'd been, but they seemed to know it already. And we were asked a series of pretty mature questions. You know, were you exposed to the infected fluids? No, we weren't. Do you know what to look for and what to do? Yes, we do. Uh, so it was actually pretty calm uh, and pretty comforting. All right. Let me, uh, I got to take a break, but let me try to get one in quickly here because it involves plane travel. Danielle, can you catch Ebola on a plane? Alita Saudi of uh, Toronto asking that one. Very difficult. I mean, first of all, in the early stages of infection, Ebola is not nearly as easy to transmit. So when people have no symptoms at all, or in the, they're in that early stage of symptoms that we've been talking about, uh, the, no, the amount of virus that's likely to be in their body fluids is much lower uh, than it is in the later stages of the disease. So it's pretty unlikely that a person who is carrying, has what we call a high viral load, who's got lots of virus in their bodily secretions, is going to walk onto a, uh, onto a commercial flight, sit down next to you, and share your, your airplane meal, which is basically, you know, um, what what we, we, pretty much what would have to happen. So I, I, I think it is unlikely enough that people do not need to worry about the safety of air travel. All right, got to take that break I was talking about. But when we come back, We'll look at this angle. The Canadian government has pledged tons of medical supplies to the Ebola affected regions, and yet so often those supplies sit in Canadian warehouses for weeks, if not months. Welcome back to our special national checkup answering your questions. With us in studio, Drs. Danielle Martin, Tim Jukatic, and Susan Potenin. And also in Toronto, our own Adrian Arsenault. Here is the last question of the night. Come in by video. Here it is. Hi, I'm Randy from Toronto. The Canadian government has pledged tons of medical supplies to the Ebola affected regions, and yet so often those supplies sit in Canadian warehouses for weeks, if not months. So my question is, what can be done to expedite the delivery and distribution of those supplies in the regions that need them most? All right, Tim, you've been there. What could help? 
Well, we have supply chains that exist already. Uh, we're at risk of losing supply chains if we have travel bans. So we have to keep our ability to get there open. We have to get more people on the ground to actually be there to take the supplies. So this is what we need, more people, and we need to keep the, the travel going. And then we can get there and stop this thing. Danielle. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, this is not a medical question. This is an infrastructure mm -hmm. question, you know, and it really has to do with global development. So it's far beyond um, just the, the health care issue, the need to, to support development in these communities that, um, that allows them to build infrastructure, not just for this epidemic, but more generally. Susan. As a healthcare worker, what really speaks to me personally when I hear the stories are from the frontline workers are the incredible disconnect from what we're doing here to prepare for the potential one case we may get compared to what's going on in the front lines with healthcare, healthcare workers on, on site. I think to, to speak to the healthcare worker point of view of us donating our time and, and moving out, um, having more of those stories directed right at physicians and nursing staff would really help. All right. Adrian, you get the last word on this. Uh, what's your advice on, on this? I guess the thing is with Liberia, it's not that it, it needs supplementing of the basics. It's a country that doesn't even really have the basics. Uh, to give you an example, it takes about 200 liters of water to treat and care for one Ebola patient per day. And yet we were at hospitals where Ebola patients were turning up and there wasn't any water, water at all. A nurse had to dive into her pocket and pull out a bit of change to give to someone to run down the street to get even a few bottles of water. It's a country with great rubber plantations that has a critical shortage of rubber gloves. So really, it's a mess. They need everything. All right, Adrian. We uh, are looking forward to having Adrian back in the building within the next couple of days. Thank you to all of you. And thank you as well. There's lots more on Ebola on our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national.